Hi, and welcome to Random Walks in HR with me, Tim Peffers. And today we're talking about skills inference, which is this new cool, sexy thing that we're doing in people analytics. And I hope it will be still cool and sexy and actually works out in the next five years, because otherwise, when you watch this video in the future, I'm going to look like a real idiot. But fingers crossed, and let's do it. So today we're talking about people analytics, and in particular, we're talking about the data that we need for people analytics. And really today, I want to focus on, yes, yeah, skills inference, skills data. Now, traditionally, what companies do and, and what we do within L&D and org development is we try and get skills data by asking employees. And sure, they know what the skills they have, but then often they then have a fight with the manager and the manager thinks it's a big waste of time. And then we spend a whole load of time arguing about, well, actually, what is a skill? What is the taxonomy? And then we spend a whole long time chasing people up to complete skills assessments. And actually, even though we know the data is highly valuable, we spend probably about 90 to 95% of the process actually collecting the data and cleaning the data rather than actually taking action on the data. So usually the whole process ends up as a big waste of time and really irritates employees. This is where skills inference comes in. Now skills inference essentially is, is taking data that we have lying around all over our HR systems and then running some natural language processing algorithms through this data to understand actually what are the skills people have. So to give you an example, um, I've pulled a job description of a people analytics role. And what I've done is I've thrown it through an open source uh, uh, skills inference API. This one is from MZ, so it's completely free to use. You just sign up, you can put a job description through their tool, and then out comes all the different skills on the other side. And as you can see from the skills inference, we're saying this job had these talent analytics, business strategies, workforce planning. Um, it is not perfect towards the bottom. It's saying you need to know about neurons. Actually, what the job description talks about is talent neuron. But again, if you're doing this yourself or even uh, as you're doing that they'll they'll see the problems and the algorithm will learn to improve and understand what actually are the skills that are needed within your organization so how is it doing this well it's very simple uh, what you do is you take any data that's lying around that really describes what people do. And actually in HR, we have a ton of it that we don't really leverage, okay? You look in your applicant tracking system, your recruitment system, there's CVs and there's job adverts that literally describe exactly what skills people have and actually what the uh, what the role entails. Otherwise, the HR system, we've got job descriptions quite a lot of the time. We've also got job history and education. So you can see actually what roles they used to do, um, what they studied at university. It's going to give you even more information around what skills they have and then you've got great sources wherever your performance uh, management data is so performance reviews objectives um, development um, uh, objectives and also feedback if you record feedback formally anywhere the uh, data is describing actually what people do uh, and, and how good they are at it is absolute gold okay and the more data the better so we take all this data, or even some of it, whatever you think is the most impactful and the most important. We do pre-processing. So this is where the natural language process comes in. We strip out parts of the word. We do things called lemmatization and tokenization, but we don't need to know about that just now. We'll do a separate post about natural language processing. And essentially what the algorithm does is it starts attaching keywords to skills. So let's say, um, let's take a skill, uh, Python, okay? Python is a programming language. What you'll see within the CV or the job description or the IDP or whatever are certain keywords that aren't found anywhere else. You know, things like NumPy, things like Pandas, things like TensorFlow, things like NeuralNets, TSNI, all these different Python specific words and then understand, okay, I'm seeing all these different words. I associate them in Python. Therefore, I'm confident that this employee has skills in Python. They will have different words associated with a different programming language like R or, or C++ or whatever. And then what I'll understand is actually, okay, we've got Python skills, and then we can start grouping those together into bigger capability buckets, whether it's data literacy or IT or technical skills, whatever we need to think about skills at a more strategic level to drive some of those bigger ticket and more strategic initiatives around where exactly the company needs to develop, okay? Now, this is actually not that difficult to do if you have uh, people within your team who have data science skills. Um, 
what you do need to do though, and this is where you probably do need some technology or tools, is understanding uh, and actually applying this feedback loop. So we need to put this information back into the hands of employees. One, to train the algorithm, to test if actually the, uh, you know, when it said, uh, you know, pandas we associated with Python, is not actually um, picking up that actually this person actually has zookeeping skills or whatever. So we need to get that feedback loop so the algorithm improves. We also need to put the information into employees' hands so they can take action on it. They can develop whichever skills gap. So we still have value in all those things we usually do around closing skills gaps and developing. What we're doing is we're taking the pain away from the employee and the manager by giving a starting uh, a starting position of these are the 10, 12, 15 skills we think you have, and they only have to sort of validate and say, actually, yes, you're right with about 10 of these, but a couple of these skills are off. Now, at a more uh, macro level, strategic level, skills data is an absolute gold mine. Okay, there's all these different things we can do. We've talked a little bit about talent development, but we can also think about, well, what are the critical skills for the organization? Either to deliver the strategy, or what are going to be key skills that's going to give us that competitive advantage going forward? And then we can think about developing those skills and also not developing skills that maybe we won't need in the future, whether we're, we're, we're moving out of industries and markets, whether we're ending the life of products, or also some skills are becoming redundant due to technology. Skills have a half-life. It's shortening. It's the skills you learn are going to be useful for less time because there's new skills or new technology always coming in either replacing those or finding a better way to do stuff. So it's really important that we understand we develop the right skills for the future. In terms of strategic workforce planning, think about the supply and demand at a very strategic and long-term level, really useful to understand, okay, what are those big buckets, those capabilities like data and literacy, like project management, like product management, like customer service or collaboration, and then understanding what are the different skills that we need to be developing so that we have a workforce in the future that is capable of delivering the strategy but also maintaining that competitive advantage within the marketplace. Now, strategic workforce planning is kind of that more long-term strategic, high-level um, skills use. There's also some really interesting work happening now in terms of internal talent marketplaces, okay? So what we need to do is have a better mechanism to match people to jobs, okay? So if we know what skills people have and then we know what kind of projects that are going on or what kind of, uh, what kind of tasks and processes are happening, if we understand where the skills are in the organization, we can leverage internal talent first before we reach out and go externally to try and, I don't know, hire new people or maybe bring in third parties to do certain work for us. Uh, another cool uh, use of it is around talent, thinking about bench strength succession planning. You know, your, your successor to your CFO might not actually be in finance. They might be in risk or they might be in IT. They might have 80 or 90% of the skills and the, those leadership capabilities that they need, but actually you just need to train them up. But it, suddenly you can unleash a whole load of bench strength and lots of um, potential successes if you understand what skills everyone has. And the last one is about benchmarking. If you think about, um, you can take job adverts from your own website, put them through this process. You can also take job adverts from your competitors' um, recruitment websites and then understand, well, what skills are they recruiting? This is especially useful if, if you know which companies are maybe more mature than you are, are further along in their transformation journeys, or maybe they're the real innovators within your market. Then you can actually see what skills they're bringing in to understand, okay, how can we also incorporate these skills? or What do we need to be developing? Because when we move to a product or project-based organization, we then have these skills already built so that we're successful um, when we get there. So if that's a bit conceptual, I put some kind of examples here. So take a machine operator. Once we know the skills that you have to do or the soft skills or the technical skills, you can then understand against other roles within your organization, actually, what are the kind of career paths? And there are some obvious ones. You know, it's not that weird to, to move from machine operator to a maintenance technician. But you start unearthing actually some really interesting stuff that actually a lot of those skills, especially those core skills, those kind of quality assurance skills are actually also very useful in say IT analyst or software tester roles right it's just you need to develop certain SME or specialist skills to then allow that person to redevelop but if you think about automation coming into to the word to to the workplace um, 
these are probably more future-proof roles. And instead of having to get rid of a load of machine operators because we've got new new tools coming in, we can think about converting them to, to the skills that we need to then run those new machines and those new technologies. The other thing that's really interesting here is also the local talent market, okay? If we understand skills, we understand the external talent market, we can also understand, okay, when we need some of these future skills, like IT analysts or software testers, well, actually, how difficult is it going to be to recruit them? If there's low supply or high demand, it's going to be very competitive. It's going to cost a lot to recruit, and we may not be able to fill those vacancies as quick as we want. So these are the skills that then we need to be developing so that we can actually um, ensure that we've got the right capabilities and avoid having those key capability gaps. Anyway, that was a super fast tour through... Um, through skills inference. If it was a bit conceptual, uh, the next video is going to be a real practical application of that. So exactly what are the skills that we need um, in people analytics? And we're going to see what we can start doing with that data once we've got it. Anyway, I hope this was interesting. I hope this was useful. And I hope this wasn't a complete waste of your time. Thanks.